I'm Rosemary Bartlett with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast, Overview of the 50% Advanced Energy Design Guide for Small to Medium Office Buildings, brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy's Building Technologies Program. I'm happy to welcome our four speakers today. Jeremy Williams is currently on fellowship with the U.S. Department of Energy's Building Technologies Program. His educational background includes business, education, construction, and construction management. He was a senior graduate research assistant at Center for Construction Project Performance, Assessment, and Improvement at Michigan State University with a research focus on energy code compliance. He coordinated the Michigan Energy Code Training and Implementation Program in Michigan, a joint effort between the state of Michigan and MSU. Bing Liu is a senior research engineer at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory with more than 16 years of experience in sustainable building design and analysis, energy efficiency analysis and simulation, and high performance building metering and measurement. Ms. Liu leads the PNNL commercial building simulation team, supporting the next generations of codes and standards, ASHRAE Standard 90.1 and 189.1. She also chaired the project committee to develop the first advanced energy design guide targeting 50% energy savings for small to medium offices. Dr. Merle McBride is employed by Owens Corning and works at their Center of Science and Technology. His technical focus has been on the energy performance of residential and commercial buildings, focusing on U.S. energy codes and standards. Dr. McBride has served on several ASHRAE technical committees and on all of the 30% and 50% AEDG project committees. His current committee appointments include Standards 189.1, 90.1, and Chair of 90.2. Michael Lane joined Puget Sound Energy in May of 2011 as Senior Energy Management Engineer working in the Business Energy Management Division. Previously, he was Project Manager and Lead Lighting Specialist at the Lighting Design Lab. Michael is a member of the IES and serves on the IES Outdoor Environmental Lighting and IES Energy Management Committees. The ASHRAE 90.1 Energy Committee as co-vice chair and has served on six AEDG project committees. In 2004 and 2010, Michael received the IES Presidential Award. Welcome again to all of the speakers. Jeremy Williams is going to start us off. Jeremy, take it away. Hello, I'd like to say welcome and thank you uh, to all the attendees for joining us today. My name is Jeremy Williams and I'm a fellow with the Department of Energy Building Technologies Program, part of the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. I'm going to start us off today by introducing the 50% Advanced Energy Design Guide or AEDG series and then the following speakers uh, will give us some more details on uh, the small and medium office guide. So, this uh, section of the presentation will include a brief introduction to the guides. We'll cover some of the questions such as uh, what are the advanced energy design guides, um, some additional background, who develops those guides, and talk a little bit about where uh, the, the current 50% uh, series of guides is headed. So the AEDG series, or I should say the Advanced Energy Design Guides uh, in general, set out to assist in helping uh, you as designers, building owners, um, et cetera, uh, kind of develop uh, high performance or green or energy efficient buildings and provide some real recommendations by building types and geographic location. And when I say geographic location, I mean the, by DOE climate zone. These are in line with the DOE energy savings targets. So DOE develops targets such as the 50% savings targets and then some of the other programs within DOE such as the Building Energy Codes program uh, kind of work there, uh, the work that we're currently doing around those targets. So for example, in the codes program, we currently have a 50% goal to um, realize energy savings above and beyond uh, baseline code. So these guides are a, they're really, um, a collection of experts with combined experience from uh, various uh, various uh, segments of the market and the industry. They're in line with those DOE energy savings targets. They these guides uh, primarily apply to new commercial construction, although they apply beyond simply new commercial as well. And um, overall, these are for educational guidance. So, in other words, they are not a code or a standard, and, and that has some 
some uh, positives and uh, negatives really to that. So they're not written in enforceable code language. However, the advantages to that is we're able to make more specific um, and functional recommendations through the guides where a, such as an energy code could not do that. These can also be referenced as a compliance option in above code options such as uh, the LEED building rating system or other green building systems. So who makes the AEDGs? The, AED, the Advanced Energy Design Guides um, are really a partnership of the organizations you see at the base of the slide there. And that includes ASHRAE, DOE, um, the American Institute of Architects, the U.S. Green Building Council, and IES. And these professional organizations um, provide members to project committees. And each of those project committees are really set around a certain building type. So you get a, a really quality level of knowledge and specializa specialization within a certain building type. So whereas hospitals require a different type of expertise than perhaps office buildings, we are able to provide general recommendations and, and keep everything consistent and uniform across the, the uh, series of guides and the different building types, but still provide the level of specialization with the certain building type needed. So these are backed by the Department of Energy National Labs. Um, the labs provide a lot of the energy simulation, the technical analysis, and technical support to the guide development process. And then they go through the ASHRAE peer review and commentary process from there. So this, the Advanced Energy Design Guide series that are out there, there are, there are two series currently out there. The 30% series was the previous series, and then we are currently developing the 50% and uh, second AEDG series. The 30% series, so just kind of going back and recapping what happened with the 30% series. The 30% AEDGs were compared to the ASHRAE standard 90.1 1999 commercial uh, energy standard. There were uh, six guides produced in that 30% series covering small office buildings, small retail, K-12 uh, schools, warehouses, highway lodging, and um, small hospitals. Each one of those is available for free download at that link you see on the slide there through the ASHRAE website. And uh, they, they go, um, th the typical format you see with the ADG series is by building type, and, um, and then the recommendations within that guide are by building type cover the different climate zones and get into more detail there. Currently, we are working on the 50% AEDG series and there will be four guides in this series. And those guides will be for small to medium office buildings, K-12 uh, schools, medium to big box retail, and large hospitals. Now, the important thing to remember here is the 50% series is over ASHRAE standard 90.1 2004. So it's not as simple as 30 being cranked up to 50%. They are in comparison to uh, two different baseline codes. So anytime you're working with above targets or percentage improvements, um, especially with buildings, it's always important to keep in mind what that baseline is. Some background on the AADGs. Uh, these are often described as a cookbook approach to energy efficiency. The guides provide different design packages, strategies. These are designed to help uh, owners, designers, but not, not just simply owners and designers, really anybody involved with high performance buildings or energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, they provide detailed guidance as well, and we've also heard of them being used to start the conversation on energy efficiency. So putting it in the middle of that uh, project committee meeting and using it to build the conversation around from there. They also help to uh, compare again. So if you have a project, it, it may be a high performance project. It may be a small remodel. Um, it really helps to compare back to the recommendations in these AEDGs to, to know where your project stands as well. These are uh, what's called a whole building approach. Um, they cover the envelope, fenestration, lighting, as well as daylighting, HVAC, uh, service hot water, some of the other mechanical equipment, plug and process loads. So all of, 
uh, the recommendations in the guide are inclusive of all of these things. Continuing with the background, uh, we find these guides are most commonly used by architects and engineers, but as well as owners, developers, or like as I said previously, anyone interested in energy efficiency or high performance buildings will find value in these guides. They're primarily new commercial construction, but they can also be used for uh, major or renovations, building additions, remodels, um, or even system upgrades. So even if it's not a whole building, again, it helps to compare the, the choices being made in your project back to the recommendations in these guides. Behind the guides, there are there is a series of 50% technical support documents, otherwise known as TSDs. Uh, these um, provide a lot more detail, I guess I would say, than, than the guides. Whereas the guides are created to be mostly user friendly, some of the meat that goes into producing these guides can be found in the technical support documents. There are a number of these for the 50% series. Uh, for by building type, they are small office, medium office, large office, large hospital, medium retail, grocery stores, highway lodging facilities, quick service restaurants. One of the things that the TSDs have that the AEDGs don't go into detail on are a cost effectiveness analysis. And like the AEDGs, these are also available for free download through the ASHRAE um, AEDG webpage. So looking at the impact of these guides, as of lately, there are over 329,000 copies of these in circulation. So that's of September 2nd of this year, and it grows daily. Um, these really promote energy efficiency outside of the, even outside of the U.S. Well, they're probably, as you can see in the graph there, they are predominantly used in the U.S., but they're starting to uh, have some impact or more of a pickup in Canada, uh, specifically India, and uh, as well as other countries worldwide, worldwide, Australia, Brazil, and so forth there in the chart to the right on the slide. They are also um, often referenced in RFB, or excuse me, RFP specifications, so owners that wish to ensure that um, these recommendations are part of the project development process will reference these specifically in the RFP for a project. Uh, they also are uh, commonly inform the commercial code development process. So in developing ASHRAE standard 90.1, 189.1, they also have an impact on the USGBC uh, rating system as well. So here's what's coming in the future. Uh, we're currently developing these four building types, so small to medium office, which is available right now for free download on the AADG. Um, ASHRAE website and the link that was included uh, previously in the presentation. There is a K through 12 schools guide that should be available next month sometime. And then keep an eye out for the medium to big box retail guide um, targeted for January of 2012. And then the large hospital guide, uh, the fourth guide in the 50% series is scheduled to come uh, late spring of 2012. So that closes our introduction. Uh, before I let you go, I would like to request your feedback. If, if, if you're using these guides on a project, if you're interested in these guides, uh, we would really like to know how they're being used. We, we have a pretty good idea who is using them, and we'd like to know more about how specifically they're being used. I'd like to encourage you to email me personally. If you have some feedback on the guides, you can tell me how they've helped the project, how they've gotten the project started. I would really uh, like to know more on that issue. I'd also like to remind you to ask questions as we go. Uh, we'll be able to address those questions a lot easier if we get those throughout the presentation and then there's a scheduled question and answer period towards the end of the presentation. So with that, I'd like to introduce Bing Lu. She is the Small to Medium Office Project Committee Chair from Pacific National Laboratory. So thank you for participating in today's webinar. And Bing, take it away. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, in the next several uh, of the sessions, uh, myself and several of my uh, project committee members will talking about specifically for this first AEDG uh, small media office building guide targeting 50% energy reductions for uh, office buildings. Let me introduce my project committee. 
as Jeremy mentioned earlier, the form of the project committee is also representing the variety of different organizations and professional um, their committees. So um, their, my project committee members are convinced by a group of industry professional, professionals. They represent the ASHRAE, AIA, USGBC, IES, and the DOE. Also, a lot of them are practitioners and also designers, so they, they do in their daily work really knows and have figured out what's the best practice to design a low energy used buildings in the real world. So there are also architects, lighting designers, daylighting designers, HVAC engineers, etc. So that's the, they are the primary owner, authors to develop this guide. And also um, I'd like to introduce my two colleagues, um, Brian Thornton and Dr. Wei Wang from PNL. They provide and brought a tremendous of analytical skills to provide extensive analysis as the foundation when we develop the recommendation criteria in this guide. Another person I want to acknowledge, which is not on the list of my project committee, is Bill Worthland from AIA. He is on the ADG steering committee representing AIA. He also hands down to help our project committee by introducing the integrated project deliverable concept and really try to close the gap between architect and the engineers in terms and promote the integrated design process. I will talk a little bit more related to the integrated design process in the following session. The scope of the ADG small media office buildings. It's, we really try to cover the small to media office buildings up to 100,000 square foot in gross floor areas. And we try to cover the buildings like administrative, professional, government, bank, uh, financial service buildings, and some of even medical offices. So that's the major building types uh, in a category called office building is really also in line with the commercial building uh, energy consumption service, uh, so-called CBAS data from their uh, principal building uh, areas definition as well. And in the, uh, these buildings, we also have a lot of space types, including the open plan, private offices, conference room, meeting rooms, corridors, and other transition areas, lounge, uh, lobbies, uh, storage, restrooms, mechanical utility rooms, etc. However, I have to point out is the guide doesn't cover some specialty spaces, such as data centers, which is, we believe, more typical in the large office buildings, or some, some people call that as IT closet. I'd like to uh, give a really high-level um, framework introductions of the guide. What is in the book? The book has uh, several major chapters. Uh, we have forward, which is really uh, writing uh, towards to the realtors and the investors, try to make a business case to building owners and why, uh, what's the motivation, what's the, what's what's really the benefit to design a low energy use buildings. And we have introduction chapter. Um, the next chapter is the expanded guidance on integrated design. Chapter three really focused on integrated design strategies. This is this is really focused on the performance strategies for those um, of the designers who do want to use their prescriptive table recommendations as in chapter four. And we have several whole building case studies in this chapter as well. Chapter four is the recommendation tables by climate locations. It's a, we have general strategies 
by different climate zones, and we have prescriptive, prescriptive recommendations by specific climate location as well to cover the, all the components of the building design. Chapter 5 is the how-to section chapter. It's really talking about, okay, um, for your particular climate locations, you want me to have a particular technologies or uh, criteria to meet in Chapter 4. Now, the question is how, how to do the designs, how to operate the buildings. So the Chapter 5 is really um, uh, gave a lot of good design practices. We call how-to tips, a lot of good technical examples, and covers additional bonus, which is we believe you don't need them to you to get to your 50% energy savings goal, but we know they are, we call that bonus savings, and can use as kind of a trade-off as well, including top lighting, natural ventilation, and even renewable. As I mentioned earlier, chapter two and three is really focused on First, introduce the integrated project delivery process and multidisciplinary recommendations and the major energy saving focus from building envelope, lighting, plug load, HVAC system, and the service water heater. In the next sessions, I will have a few slides really focused on talking about the uh, a new feature in this guide is the integrated design process and strategies. This is the uh, uh, case studies examples from the uh, chapter three. Uh, we have a few buildings from its really real world experience uh, for designers, design team who already figured out how to uh, design and build a very low energy use building and in a cost effective way. Uh, so that's the case studies pr provide a good examples. And also, it demonstrates the flexible abilities they offer in achieving the low energy use as well. And in, in each of the case studies, we also provide a text describing the energy features used and the technology implemented in these guides as, as well. Chapter 4, again, uh, the main body of the Chapter 4 is recommendation tables by your climate zones. So you can go to your counties and find your climate zone um, through this graphic map. Then you're going to see two pages of the recommendation tables for each of climate zone. For these two pages, it covers uh, the major component of the buildings from envelope, lighting, mechanical systems, park load, et cetera. Again, Chapter 5 is really focused on the good practice. So what I'm showing here is some technology examples. Also, in Chapter 5, we provide some cautions. The cautions is also important. When you try to implement something new, when you try to design something new, we collect a lot of lessons learned so you can avoid anything, you know, um, some lessons learned, we already know um, you have to be very careful when you try something new. The next few slides, I will talk, touch base a little bit about integrated design process. Uh, before I start it, I have to emphasize again, this is a guide. It really provides a good practice, and it provides a one way, but really not only way through the prescript tables. Uh, the purpose is real educational tutorial on the elements of the integrated design for energy conservations. We also pro present a description of required design tasks uh, by different design phases from the concept design, uh, design all the way to uh, construction documents, MNV, you know, and during the construction side. So it's a 
the different what you should do differently through the whole life of a building design and a construction. We cannot stress more the importance of energy modeling for design of a high performance building or low energy use building. It's the modeling is a very powerful tool to use to link all the design team together to think the building as a whole and design in a holistic way. Instead of, you know, to do the modeling, if after design already done, is we, we usually lose opportunity to optimize and balance all the different design decisions. So the prescript tables we provide in Chapter 4 is just showing, okay, through the design uh, using the modeling as the one way at least, you know, we know can help you to significantly reduce your energy use in that building. But we cannot emphasize more to encourage you to use energy modeling as a tool at the early design stage to help make a key decision. This is the uh, busy bubble chart. Um, I like traditional design teams, which is more really like uh, hierarchy, you know, stuff from it's a linear relationship from building owners to architects to uh, specialties like, uh, you know, MEP design uh, teams. The multidisciplinary design team, we have a design team lead as architect, engineer, project manager, or owners represented as a center. But the communication interaction um, is really not linear. It's, it's really two-way communication. So that means even at a very early design stage, in order to have an integrated design process, you have to be able to engage all the key players in the design team. So from um, if you have daylighting designers, you have um, contractors, um, so um, mechanical IQ, indirect qualities, you have to um, facility people, make sure they are also a part of the key decision maker as well. This is a very busy chart. One of the, our project committee uh, member, Erin McConaughey from Arab, and she really pushed hard on the concept of the interactions about the different components of the building as well. So the focus of this concept is uh, separate the building load generator and the building load satisfier. So um, even at the early design stage, there's a lot of design decisions have interactive impacts with each other. And there's a lot of balance we have to deal with. Um, are you going to spend your um, more first cost to have a passive um, architecture design? Then later on you have a significant reduce the load so you can save your mechanical system uh, money um, or you, you do the other way. So our philosophy uh, in terms of when we develop this guide is we trying to reduce the loads from envelope, from lighting, and from park load as much as possible before we go to select a mechanical system. And this chart is really showing the key decision making in terms of, in terms of the building component of the inference of the internal load and the relationship from the load to uh, mechanical systems. This one, the slide is really showing their uh, saving opportunities. They are different and various by climate zones. Uh, there's no surprise on these slides, um, it's, but it's really give a good a visualize and quantify the where the saving comes from when you move from Miami, a very hot, humid climate, to um, Minneapolis, uh, very cold. So no surprise here, um, the good saving contributors is coming from cooling in Miami and a lot of coming from heating in the cold climate. But the saving opportunities for internal loads are quite consistent, such as the lighting and plug load and the fan. 
Another slide is really showing a cumulative impact of integrated design approach. Um, I have to make a point here is we didn't design the book in this way, but this one is just educational showing um, tackle the mechanical, tackle the envelope first and then going all the way down to the mechanical. That's how we got into the 50% savings. We have ground rules. One of the ground rules I, I have to point out is any technologies, tools, products we recommended in these books, at least there have to be two vendors manufacturers can make it. We really try to encourage their um, competitions. And when we take any systems, we have to have a first cost in the mind. If without a budget, you know the cost, um, we all facing the, the limited budget and cost. How to cost effectively design and build a low energy building that's really of our interest as well. And there are some rules as well as our baseline is 90.1274. But on the other side, on the systems and the product, we also must be compliant with most recent 90.1 standard as 2010 addition. In addition to energy, we also have to make sure we design a building uh, to meet standard 62.1 for ventilation and the standard, actually standard 55 for for comfort. As Jeremy mentioned earlier, in addition to the guide, we also have a technical analysis. A basic approach is we pick two different sides of the buildings to test all these ideas through the extensive simulations. And the, the energy simulations we also have can compare as a different baseline standard. So you can see when the baselines improved itself, you know, the savings, also the numbers changed differently. <clears throat> if you're interested in all this background information, all the detailed documentations of how we conduct analysis, what's the key assumptions we use in terms to reach to our recommendations, and in addition on what is the cost effectiveness of this analysis, we have two technical support document, uh, one for small office, one for media office. I provide a link uh, here. Uh, you can download them uh, of your interest. Now I'm wrapping up my over, big over, uh, quick overview of the AEDD small media office guide. Now I'm handing over to next speaker. Dr. Merle McBride of Owens County. Thank you, Bing. Uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to present an overview of the envelope material in the guide. I will be reviewing some of the envelope measures, not all of them. For this background, I want to set the stage. When we developed the 30% guide, we were able to achieve energy efficiency at, by accepting the architectural design. However, when we went to the 50% guides, we also had to change the function and form, which impacts the architectural design of the building. Finally, I'll show some new features uh, introduced into the guide. Let's start with the general design strategy, which has three major principles. First is to minimize the envelope heating and cooling loads, both sensible and late. Second is to minimize the internal loads. And the third is to maximize the mechanical system performance. My presentation will focus on envelope strategies, while subsequent speakers will address the other two strategies. There are three building envelope strategies. One is to upgrade the envelope thermal efficiency. Two is to make fundamental changes to the building basic structure and form. And third, incorporate new features. We will be viewing each of these strategies in some detail. First one is upgrading the envelope thermal efficiency. We address all the major elements of the envelope, including roofs, walls, floors, slabs, doors, vestibules. We've added infiltration, and then daylighting to get to the 50% goal. First component is uh, insulation above deck. The graph presents the uh, criteria for a uh, small office building compared to the 90.1-2004 standard. The vertical axis is the R value for the insulation material, 
and the horizontal axis is the eight climate zones. We also have details uh, in the guide that specify that there should be no thermal bridges uh, penetrating the insulation above deck. And if you have multiple layers, you need to stagger the edges to avoid thermal shorts. Continuing with uh, mass walls, same format in terms of R value and climate zones, uh, we see that mass walls have a significant upgrade in all climate zones. Again, if there's multiple layers of insulation, we uh, recommend that the joints be staggered to avoid uh, thermal shorts. Steel frame walls, again, same format. We see significant uh, upgrades in all climate zones. And we stagger the joints to those multiple layers of rigid insulation, uh, consistent with uh, above deck and mass walls as well. Unheated slats. In climate zones one through three, we have no change from the 90.1 standard. There's not a big difference in the actual energy savings that can be realized. That's also predominantly the termite zone, where you have a lot of questions about uh, exterior uh, insulation. The vertical axis on this graph is the F factor, and a lower value is better performance. So we see significant upgrades, climate zones four through seven. Uh, climate zone eight is about equivalent to what was in the standard uh, for climate zones like in Alaska. Looking at vertical fenestration, we have multiple levels of uh, performance. The first one we're going to look at is the U factor. Uh, we see that we have uh, significantly lower the U factor in most climate zones except climate zone three where the 90.1 standard already had a, a low value. The other metric we look at is uh, total heat gain coefficient. And again, the 90.1 standard had done a very good job in controlling solar heat gain. Uh, we did uh, add a criteria for climate zone eight uh, just to round out uh, for modeling purposes to have a specific value. There's also an option in the standard uh, as an appendix which uh, provides an alternative for the opaque construction. And this lists the uh, U value for above grade components, the F factor for slabs, and thermal transmittance for below grade values. And if you want to use some other construction other than the prescriptive option, as long as you meet these performance uh, metrics, you'll be in compliance with the guide. All right, the, the second major design strategy is addressing the building structure and form. Look at windows, exterior sun control, uh, addition of vestibules, daylight, glass, building orientation, and daylighting. This Building orientation is probably the biggest thing, as well as building shape, that impacts the uh, architectural's uh, basic design. And we round that out with having a need for correct lighting levels. And details around these variables begin with the windows. In terms of orientation, there's a requirement that the area for the west and the area for the east each have to be less than the area for the south. Also, the window-to-wall ratios uh, have to be between 20 and 40 percent. In terms of exterior sun control, it requires a protection factor of 0 0.5 on all the south, east, and west orientations. Vestibules is a focus on the primary occupant entrances. We have some exclusions. Uh, emergency exits, maintenance doors, loading docks, and specialty entrances. Specifically, the requirements are in climate zone one through two, there's, there's no recommendation specified. In climate zone three, that are with buildings that are larger than 10,000 square feet, there's a requirement. And in climate zone four through eight, all offices require vestibules. In terms of the daylight and glass, the visible transmittance has to be within the range of 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. We also have a requirement that controls the minimum DT divided by SHDC it has to be equal to 1.1 in all climate zones. Finally, in terms of the 
vertical uh, fenestration, the effective aperture has to be less than or equal to 0 0.12 in all climate zones. And all of these details are presented in three pages for each climate zone. It consolidates the information so you only have to look in one place by climate zone to find all the construction details. In terms of building orientation and daylighting, the vertical facade needs to provide daylighting oriented within 15 degrees of north or south. Again, this impacts your architectural design uh, with this strategy. Building shape and daylight. First, we need to locate occupied spaces with a minimum distance from the perimeter and the shape of the building footprint so that all occupants are within 30 feet of perimeter fenestration. Building footprint, so regularly occupied spaces within 15 feet of the perimeter. Finally, ensure that 75% of the occupied spaces are within 20 feet of the perimeter wall. Accompanying that, we need to have uh, correct lighting levels. In clear sky conditions, the illuminance levels should be 25 foot candles to 250. In overcast conditions, we need to achieve a daylight factor of 2%, but no more than 20%. The third strategy is new features we've added in the 50% guide do not exist in the 30% guide. Three activities focusing on first, mitigation of thermal bridges, continuous air barriers, thermal mass to reduce loads. We have some examples of mitigation of thermal bridges in roofs, walls, and foundations. In terms of roofs, we have increased wall insulation is the classic example, increased roof insulation, and then we have an effective thermal bridge because those two are not continuous. So for the 50% guy, the recommendations are that we have to have continuity of that exterior wall insulation up and over the parapet, and it connects down to the roof insulation so that there's no thermal bridge to short circuit uh, the effectiveness of the insulation. In terms of windows, they have to be set in the insulation plane not in the exterior surface of the wall. Again, this is provide continuity of the uh, integral, thermal integrity of the envelope. In foundations, uh, typically we run the insulation on the exterior wall down to the uh, slab. You can insulate the slab on the interior side of the stem wall, and then you have a nice thermal short at the uh, floor slab itself. For well, the 50% guide, we recommend that that insulation extend continuously down the exterior surface uh, below grade. And with that, then you need to provide a continuous uh, insulation protection coating uh, above grade. In terms of continuous air barriers, they're required for the entire building envelope for all offices and all climate zones. Finally, we get into uh, thermal mass to reduce thermal loads. We want to improve thermal comfort with passive solar designs, and this will be applied in areas <clears throat> where appropriate, uh, not in occupied spaces that would have an impact on uh, comfort of the occupant. So in conclusion then, uh, strategy to the heating and cooling loads is the first step in achieving 50% energy savings. The strategy is upgrade the thermal envelope efficiency, make fundamental changes to the building structure and form, and incorporate new features. That concludes my portion of the presentation. Uh, the next speaker I'll introduce is Michael Lane. Thank you, Merle. Um, I'm going to move on here to the next slide first. So daylighting and electric lighting strategies for the 50% advanced energy design guide uh, was my part. So if we look at the climate zone recommendation tables, you can kind of really get a good idea of all the various recommendations that um, are, are part of the lighting. Um, we talk about interior, interior surface reflectances, very, very important. Uh, keep the reflectances high inside the building, the ceiling maybe at 80 percent, walls at somewhere around 70 percent reflectance. Partitions also, again, very, very important. Um, the 
as the daylight and the electric light come into the space, we need to not absorb those in the partitions, let's say, above uh, a desk height. Below desk height, uh, you can really do whatever you want. Um, open office uh, partitions parallel to the window wall, um, you know, we're doing, dealing with an office building, and, and one of the problems is the, um, the partitions, the, the cubicles um, that um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to evacuate the building. <laughs> Rose, you're going to have to go on to the next one. Sorry. Okay. Okay, we'll do. There's always something exciting that happening, happens when we do a webcast live. So hopefully Michael will be able to come back and pick up his piece, but for now we're going to uh, jump to Bing Lu for HVAC. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let me uh, add the long slides a little bit. Um, I'll go down and click up for you, Bing. Okay. Thank you, girls. <clears throat> well, I hope um, uh, Mike come back to our webinar uh, in a few minutes when he uh, found a new place, uh, evacuated himself, whatever. <laughs> um, it's interesting. And uh, um, I will. Uh, um, switch the gear a little bit, talking about their HVAC strategies for the 50% ADG guide. Um, this is a slide is really um, the Dan Now's presentation. Um, he had last minute um, project, so he cannot make it to uh, to this webinar. So there, um, I hope I can um, give the summary as compelling speaker as he is, but I'm trying. <laughs> Uh, the credit of the presentation also goes to Mick Schwadler from Train and Aaron McConaughey of Arab. Dan, Mick, and Aaron are our the key members, authors, developed their mechanical strategies for this book. Uh, they did a wonderful job uh, to tackle on the mechanical portion of their guide as well. We have principles when we're talking about an identified HVAC systems. We are really try to focus on the mechanical systems have provide us a very high system efficiency, but still within the reach of our construction cost budget. So um, one of the things we're facing is we know there are some uh, emerging technologies will give us a lot of good, you know, energy savings, but also um, it's now cheap, going to be very expensive. So our consideration for system is really comparable to con conventional systems. Okay, our principle number one is high equipment efficiency first. Focus on both at the full load and the power load part as well, because we know the building operates most time at the power load, not the full load. So we tackle both of the full load and the power load in terms of the equipment efficiency. The second principle is really have a better humidity controls and outdoor ventilation air maintenance as well. The strategy we put in together is really try to separate the outdoor air treatment from the recirculated air. The next one is we try to reduce the air distribution losses. One more strategy and also principle is the best BTU you use is the one you already have. What I mean is there's a heat generated from building and can we recover that heat to use the other part of the building. So that's really the concept we have in terms of energy recovery in all the climate zones. We will go through all six mechanic systems we recommend in this guide in the next few slides. The six system types we recommend in this guide are including a constant volume air source heat pump system with dedicated outside air system, a water source heat pump, which is small size water source heat pump system with DOIS as well, a VV fan coils with DOIS, the reading heating cooling systems, and air cool VVDX with indirect gas fire heating or electric baseboard. That's really depend on the climate their climate location or region preference. And two water wave systems with air-cooled chiller and hydronic distributions and the condensing boiler, et cetera. 
We know other systems may work, but we didn't test that in our guide of studies. Well, when we started working on taking on the 50% energy reduction challenges, we know previously approach we made on the 30% ADG solutions doesn't work for our 50% savings. It's a very challenging goal to reduce to design a building with such a low energy use target. So um, in the past, when we're working on the service and ADG series, in terms of mechanical systems, we try to maintain the same conventional mechanical system types, just promote a premier um, equipment efficiency. It won't work this way. In the next several slides, I will give a very high-level highlight of each of the systems and their energy impact. The first one is the single package air source heat pump system. It's small heat pump systems you can use in the small office buildings. Uh, first, um, we have a premier DX heating cooling efficiency in terms of ER or COP. Second, this kind of heat pump, heat pump can operate at a very low outdoor air temperature, as low as the minus four Fahrenheit. And we have we know a multiple major manufacturer can make this kind of product. The other component is we using dedicated outdoor air system so better um, incorporated with energy recovery and have a better humidity control. And there are some other <clears throat> components as such as uh, because this is a steel air distribution system, so we have a low pressure drop that design requirement. Uh, this is really a trade-out because you may have a bigger, relative a little bit bigger duct work, so you have to coordinate with your architect to get a, you know, saline space to run your duct work as well. But the trade-off is you have reduced all of the fan energy use. And we have demand control ventilations as well. I will have you to take a quick look of the energy impact result by using these systems. This is the result is in addition to um, the envelope um, recommendations, lighting, daylighting strategies, and with these particular system types. So this is the whole building energy impact, including the plug load. Um, you can see across the board, we are able to reach the 50% reduction um, compared to building, the same building just built to meet 90.24 requirement. So we have two bars. The bar on the left is the building, um, a small office building. Uh, if you build in Miami, what is their uh, predictable energy use, annual energy use in terms of KBTU per square foot per year, um, just meet the 90.24 requirement. And the red bars is if you use the recommendations in, tab in Chapter 4 for uh, Miami Climate Zone 1, what's the energy use and um, um, predictions uh, for that particular building. And we have uh, end use breakdown from interior lighting, exterior lighting, plug load, fan, um, cooling, heating, uh, so it's hot water, et cetera. The next one is really the uh, water source heat pump system with the OS as well. This is a small size of water heat pump in about five pound size range. And we have our two options. You can have a single uh, stage and the water source heat pump, then you have to really have premier very high ER and COP number. Or you can put a two stage uh, heat pumps and in that way you have a better uh, pilot um, performance as well. But neither of them, any, any of the systems, we recommend to use the ECM fan motors have better control at the power load and provide the various uh, flow as well. And we have some loop heating and cooling recommendations, again, and the DOS as here. So this is a really high, very, very highlight of the system. In the guide, we have very detailed description of each system and good practice of particular technologies and also cautions of particular system as well. So I really encourage you to look into the guide if you're considering particular system in your design. So again, um, 
This is the energy impact um, if you're using the water source heat pumps in your smart media office buildings. And we have no problem to reach the 50%. Some of them is even uh, way higher than 50% the goal we have. The next one is advanced VV systems. Um, when we started develop this guide, uh, one of the comments and opinions said, you know, VV systems is a, is kind of the sunset systems is not going to help us to design and reach to a low energy use of the buildings. We said, okay, that may be true for traditional VV systems as starting using in the 1970s and 80s. But there are a lot of things related to AV system. You can improve your design and the control um, algorithm, and you can have a better, um, much more efficient AV systems. Um, one of the highlights is uh, you use energy recovery uh, in your AV systems. So you can recover return air heat to uh, pre, uh, treat your outdoor air. Uh, the other highlight is the su supply air temperature reset. And we have a different reset the temperatures um, in versus um, humid, hot climate compared to the um, dry or cold climate uh, temperatures. Uh, the reset idea is also trying to have a better balance between the compressor energy use, fan energy use, and increasing to use the uh, more use of a comp matter as well. And in certain dry climate, we also recommend indirect electric cooling as well. Again, we always have our demand control ventilations. So this is the energy impact of using advanced VAV systems. We have no challenge um, to meet the 50% goal across the different climate. Again, the subcomponent in that VAV system are various among different climates. Like, as I mentioned earlier, in some several of the dry climate, um, these systems also include their uh, indirect evapocooling systems. The advanced fan core system. This is really one part of the hydronic system. We want to give their flexible and more options to designers as well. Um, for fan core systems, the goal is really twofold. First, we try to reduce the pump energy use uh, as much as possible. The second part is really try to uh, reduce the fan core, increase the fan uh, efficiency. So the recommendation is using the ECM fan motors. And uh, in terms of the chill water systems, we recommend it to have a 14 degree delta T between the supply and the return water. Uh, in that way, we can more efficiently move the water among the pipes. So there's a lot of details going down here. And on the hot water side, we're using condensing boilers. Um, this is the result for uh, if we use the advanced fan core system in um, more towards the media size of the office buildings. The next one is advanced reading system with DOIs. Two of our um, project committee members, both Dan Now and Aaron McConaughey, they have um, practiced, have designed the reading systems in the office building application. Uh, so we have a quite a um, first-hand experience from them uh, how to, um, you know, what's the best practice in terms of their application of reading systems. Um, so we're able to take a lot of them from their brain and put into recommendations down here for reading systems. So the, uh, a big advantage of the reading system is we significantly reduce the fan energy using compared with their uh, air distribution system. And uh, in some cases, you can increase the comfort of their, your space as well. But there's a lot of design details. Please pay attention to them. And the reading system performs really well, uh, except in 5B, we barely made it under 50%. We have a lot of other information in the ADG guide. Uh, one particular topic that we didn't cover at today's 
webinar is the clock load reduction. In the recommendation table, we have a section designated to clock load. As we squeeze more and more on the uh, stringency requirement of building envelope, lighting, mechanical systems, clock load actually taking more and more the share of the whole building and use consumption, in, especially in office building. So the recommendation we have in the guide, we have both the peak clock load reduction recommendations and also of our control management as well. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of how to take cautions, and we provide a lot of reference and resources at the end of the, each of the chapter. We also include in designated one session to talking about the cover, the quality assurance, and the commissioning as well. Um, Rose, how is that was able to back up? Okay. Michael has joined us again. And uh, so we're going to go back to Michael. Luckily, uh, he was able to rejoin us. So, Michael, we're going to have you go back to where you were before you were evacuated. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rose. Uh, yeah, good to be back. Um, so we were talking about some of the recommendations in the lighting uh, tables, and we were looking at this slide here. So some of the things we really want to highlight is that uh, reducing the lighting power density um, we, we reduced it down to about 0.75 watts per square foot from the around one watt per square foot that was originally in the 2004 requirements. Another additional um, requirement is reducing the 24-hour lighting. One of the major uh, nighttime uses we see is lights that are left on to provide emergency egress when the building is actually unoccupied. And according to NFPA 101 and the NEC, as long as the building is unoccupied, um, you don't have to meet those requirements. And there's ways to do it so that if someone's in the space, like with an occupancy sensor, if they're actually in that building, the lights will be on in those areas. But often, it's well overlit uh, for the emergency egress lighting. And we're not talking about the emergency exit signs. We're talking about the general lighting that allows you to uh, walk out of the building in a non-emergency mode. Of course, in emergency mode, the lights have to be on for the, the required time. Um, the efficiencies of, of the lamps, um, we're seeing with T8 and T5 technologies, with the uh, high-performance lamps, the lamps that produce around 3,100 lumens, around 92 uh, mean lumens per watt. Um, and of course, in, in the other sources, we, we are not uh, eliminating all sources but fluorescent. There's, there's opportunities for compact fluorescent ceramic metal halide, LEDs really like to keep those incandescents out of there. Um, so we still are allowing uh, efficiencies of around 50 lumens per watt for other sources. The ballast, there's been some increases since the 30% uh, guide um, to the NEMA premium uh, type ballast. These use maybe about 3 to 5% less energy than the standard electronic ballast that we see out there. Of course, doing some daylight harvesting primarily in the uh, open office plans, because uh, those are the ones that are most effectively lit with daylight, and we want to locate those as much as possible on the north and the south sides when daylighting is much easier to do. Of course, a lot of the automatic controls, and, and many of these, if you were reading through the 2010 90.1 standard, you'd see a lot of these control requirements in, in that standard, so we've actually put them in here. And of course, facade lighting. Reducing it even beyond the 2010 standard, and in some cases, you know, uh, do we really need to do the facade lighting, the decorative part of it, if we're trying to really do an energy efficient building? And then the recommendations for parking lots and other exterior um, applications. So the daylighting recommendations, um, definitely, as Merle had mentioned, use a shallow floor plate. If we can get the the, the people, the workers near the windows use the daylight. We can reduce or eliminate the electric lighting needs during those times. Again, as I just mentioned, the, the open office workstations locate those on the north and the south sides. Use low or translucent materials uh, for the office cubicles so that the daylight doesn't stop eight feet in uh, as it hits the first cubicle wall. 
Uh, we'd like it to get into the second cubicle, and if there's a third cubicle, actually get to those locations. Locate your private offices on the east and west perimeters um, because we're going to use occupancy sensors in those manual on occupancy sensors so that you have to turn the lights on if there's daylight coming in. There's a pretty good chance that you won't turn those on as you walk into the spaces. We also talk, are already talked about light colored uh, matte finishes and the dimming controls that we want in those spaces. So here's just a table showing you uh, the breakdown from a, a lighting standpoint and how we got down to the 0.75 watts per square foot. Um, open office reduced from 1.1 down to about 0.68. Uh, private offices, um, which comprise about 29% of an average floor. Of course, no building is average, and, and the, uh, these percentage of, of floor areas are for an average building. Uh, we got this information from the 90.1 standard. Um, and so you can see the baseline standard uh, for 2004 there in the second to the last column, and they adjusted, and at the bottom, we got down to 0.75 watts per square foot. Uh, of course, control recommendations and, and other lighting recommendations. We talked about the high-performance lens fluorescent fixtures. We'll see a picture of those here in a minute uh, of what those really are. But it's kind of a, a relatively new advancement. Maybe in the last three to five years, these types of luminaires have been coming out, and they're much more efficient at producing light down on the work surface and on the walls than the older style. Uh, parabolic fluorescence or the basket style, um, recess basket style uh, fixtures. Using the high high efficiency uh, fluorescent lamps and, and NEMA premium ballasts. Um, of course, dimming the general lighting in the open offices. Um, do, using a dual circuit occupancy sensor in the private office or a manual on, uh, they both save about the same. The dual circuit, what it does is it, as you walk into the space, it actually turns on automatically 50% of the lights, and you manually have to turn on the other 50%. Um, so that, that's, and, and the savings are about equal of doing that type of scenario versus a manual on occupancy sensor. Uh, because many times a manual on people will automatically hit it on a uh, portion of the moat where this auto on to 50%, uh, manual on to 100%, it, it, it will save about the same and people will just walk in and hey, there's light in the space and, and continue to work. And of course, reducing that night lighting to about 10%. This is showing you um, a example of two different high performance lens fluorescent fixtures. Um, there's a number of manufacturers who make these types of light fixtures. There are probably a, a eight or nine different ones. Of course, from IES, we want to meet the IES recommended light levels for the space. So in the calculations we did, using these types of fixtures at the 0.68 watts per square feet, we're averaging about 30 foot candles with about 50 foot candles on the work surface by locating the fixtures basically right above uh, the, the workstation in the open office plans. Of course, we can't forget about the exterior lighting. Um, we only want to light the areas that we need to light and only can calculate for those areas. Uh, so basically, when we get down to about 0.1 foot candles, we assume those areas aren't lighted. Uh, so if you have a large campus, you're not going to get to count uh, walkways, pathways, uh, but you don't plan on lighting, uh, and there's really no reason to do that. Uh, design with a minimum to maximum illuminance ratio of 30 to 1. That just kind of keeps your real bright areas not feeling uh, super bright versus the dark areas. Might still be at 0.1, uh, but it feels so dark in those areas um, that it actually creates a contrast problem and a safety and security problem. So we want to keep those light levels as even as possible. Uh, also, reduce the power uh, after midnight or when the building is closed, or an hour, say, after, to about 6 a.m. to no more than 50% of the power. You know, 3 o'clock in the morning, do we need all the parking lot lights on? 3 o'clock in the morning, do we need all the pathway lighting on? Or do we need all of the facade lighting on? Let's turn those off, as we can see in the next bullet point there. Turn off the facade lighting after midnight. We don't really need that on. There's not as many people out there uh, in those uh, in those hours. 
and also use the new uh, 90.1 2010 lighting zone, uh, lighting zone three or lower recommendations for your um, exterior lighting recommendations. And that's the end of my presentation, Rose. So if we could skip ahead, I guess, to the question and answer. Is that where we're at? Yes, we'll do that. Thank you, Michael. I'm glad you were able to make it back. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to everybody. The U.S. Department of Energy wants to thank all of you for your attendance today. I wanted to put up the contact slide so you can take a moment to make any notes on that that you would like. And please note at the bottom of the slide, uh, again, is the link to download your free copy of the guide. As we continue uh, answering some questions, I'll be putting up some of the other slides that have links as requested by several of you. Uh, so please keep watch on the screen as the presenters are going through and answering as many of your questions as possible. And I think we'll begin with Jeremy since he was our first speaker. Jeremy, do you have a couple questions to answer? Sure. This is Jeremy Williams from the U.S. Department of Energy. I'm going to take a quick stab at a few of the questions I saw come through here. So there were a couple questions asking specifically how the advanced energy design guides are different from LEED. So LEED is the U.S. Green Building Council's rating system for green or high-performance buildings. And the scope of that, the main difference between that and the uh, AEDGs has to do with scope. And the AEDGs uh, focus on what I'll say uh, is energy alone. So LEED explores things such as uh, site conditions, the water quality, water consumption. It gets into a lot of uh, what, what are uh, labeled as green products, which are products that, uh, for example, emit um, low levels of VOCs, uh, such as in glues and paints. Uh, and LEED also covers energy in the energy and atmosphere section. So. The ADGs take a more detailed look at uh, that energy portion and cover what I'll say is that energy portion alone, although there is some discussion and consideration uh, for things such as indoor air quality, um, how to organize an integrated design process, et cetera, because uh, these things uh, such as water and indoor air quality certainly have an effect on energy. They're not explored in detail in uh, these advanced energy design guides. So, Secondly, there was a question on stated as why would the new 50% AEDGs, which are still in development, be based off the ASHRAE 90.1 2004 standard when ASHRAE 90.1 2007 is the latest and also required by the LEED 2009 rating system. So these guides, one of the main things these guides do is, is assist in paving the way for the model energy codes. And uh, so DOE creates the guides um, in line with the department's current energy targets. On the commercial side, this is set at 50% uh, savings over 90.1 2004 currently. So ASHRAE standard 90.1 2010 is actually the most recent version um, that is available to the public. So while it would be ideal for our targets as the Department of Energy to align with um, all the codes that are out there, uh, the building rating systems that are out there, it's just not the reality we face. So all of these are developed on separate code cycles. Um, the dates don't line up. Uh, the scopes might be different. So while some, the scopes of some of those things might be focused on just energy, but for a system like LEED, uh, they, would, they would essentially have to coordinate their system with all of the latest um, energy, water, green product recommendations, all those rating systems that are out there, and that's just, just not really feasible right now. Um, it's not feasible for us as the department to coordinate um, with LEED specifically because there are a lot of other uh, interests and stakeholder uh, interest and ramifications out there, and LEED is uh, right now a voluntary system. So what is uh, also covering, what does that 50% over the baseline code mean? So when we say 50% over, what exactly are we saying? It means that if you created two identical buildings, so let's say you have one of those buildings uh, is built to ASHRAE 90.1 2004 commercial code, and one is built to the recommendations of whatever 50% AEDG you're using, that second building, the Advanced Energy Design Guide or AEDG building, should use 50% less energy. So when we say 50% over, we really mean that if there are 50% energy savings or that it uses 50% less energy than that plain old code building. So basically, if you're going beyond what I'll call the average, 
if, you, if you're going to know how far you've gotten, you've got to know where you started and what you're comparing yourself back to. So when we say 50%, that's essentially what we mean there. And then finally, uh, some were asking if there's a way you can get notified when the K-12 schools guide, the next um, advanced energy design guide, comes out scheduled sometime next month. Uh, what I would suggest is getting yourself on the ASHRAE and Department of Energy Building Technology Program email list. And you can do that by um, just Googling the ASHRAE mailing list or Google DOE BTP, and you should find a link on those websites to get on those notification or email lists. A notice for that guide and all of the guides following, or I should say the electronic free version of each one of those guides, will go out through those lists. Um, we're also going to push for what's called the Department of Energy Progress Alert, which is through the uh, Department of Energy um, Public Affairs Office. They'll send out a notification as well. So I think that covers it for my questions. I want to make sure to leave uh, time for questions with the other speakers as well. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Okay, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Bing to answer a few questions. Thank you, Rose. Um, I have a few questions uh, related to uh, some of them are really related to the questions regarding what is the baseline code, um, as Jeremy has addressed earlier. Uh, this uh, particular question asking is, I'm getting USACE, uh, Navy, and AVFAC request for proposals that are looking for 40 to 50 percent savings from the ASHRAE 90.2007 baseline. Do any of these guides meet that requirement? Um, again, our old analysis recommendation target is building in ASHRAE standard 90.2004 version as the baseline. However, we did do additional analysis and to compare if we change the different uh, version of the baseline. So I'm very happy and confident to say uh, if you implement the uh, recommendations in this guide, you're very much in line to have 40% better designs compared to 90.1-2007. Particularly for the small media office guide, our analysis showing is national averagely by implementing recommendations, you can get 46% 40, uh, better compared to 90.2004. I hope that really satisfied your uh, question. I have a few other questions related to mechanical systems. The question is really centralized are what are your baseline systems when you have uh, these six uh, different mechanical systems as the recommendations. I, I, I need to apologize. I, I think I should cover that, you know, before, uh, when, my, when I make a presentation. It's just a time crunching thing. Um, <clears throat> and in my slides, earlier slides, um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rose. <laughs> I see Rose pull up the slides here. Um, we have very detailed descriptions are what are the baseline conventional uh, systems in, in this TSD. But in general, you can see we have two different buildings we're using as a testing of the ideas. For a small office building, it's about you know 20 square foot buildings. Uh, it's constant air volume systems with the DX uh, cooling. And we have two baseline systems. One, we use electric for heating. The other is using natural gas for heating. So we have a two baseline system for smaller size of office building. For medium size office buildings, it's about 55, 50 to 55,000 square foot. It's three-story buildings. The baseline system is a VV system uh, with DX uh, for cooling and uh, furnaces for heating. It's a kind of typical rooftop unit and with uh, variable air uh, volume air system as the distribution, and have our electric system as the reheating uh, for the VAV system as well. So that's the, our um, baseline systems. Um, there's another question related to the result. Um, Rose, could you help me to advance to the slides where we have all these energy saving results? It's really towards to the end, any of them. Yeah. Okay. The, the question is really about these busy bars. Let me emphasize again. I have a two set of the stacked bars in this uh, slides for all the six 
types. The one on the left is really the same building if you build to just to meet the 90.1234 standard requirement using conventional system. What is the predicate entity use? The bar on the right is by implementing the recommendation in this guide, what is your predicted entity use in terms of the EOI. So for each of the um, uh, climate locations, people, you know, the question is in Baltimore, why see two bars? Because we're showing you what is the baseline, what is the result from this advanced entity and guide recommendation. And because the bar, because the, um, we have a recommendation how to reduce your lighting significantly. So you move from baseline to the uh, advanced cases. You can see the reduction of each of any user uh, of the building as well, uh, such that like the first one on the really, like the lower one here is, is really the reduction, amount of the reductions on interior lighting. The second one is the amount of any reductions on the exterior lighting, side lighting, etc. So I hope that really helped to clarify all these graphics. Um, so far, that's the uh, questions I have. Um, do we want to give other? Okay, how about we have Merle answer some questions then for us, Merle? Sure. Uh, I'd be glad to. Uh, a couple questions that I can immediately respond to. The first one is, a question was, what are thermal shorts? Uh, that was really maybe a shortage in terminology. Uh, I was really referring to as thermal bridges. It could also be referred to as thermal short circuits. It could also be referred to as thermal bypasses. And collectively, these are all characterizing highly conductive paths that bypass the insulation. So that's just different terminology we use to characterize that. Uh, second question, are there significant losses due to slab edge above grade? And clearly there are uh, large losses, and those should be uh, insulated. And the one sample head on thermal bridges tried to address that, whether it's for a foundation or a slab edge, it's still the same problem, and you need to insulate that um, in climate zones uh, four and above. So I had. Okay, great. Thanks, Merle. Michael? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one uh, says, please address the application of task ambient lighting approaches and associated controls for additional energy reductions. And also address whether LED lighting options allow further wattage reductions due to superior uniformity and directionality so that illuminance is optimized on the work plane versus throughout the office. The, the couple things to, to think about and to remember here, first of all, the guide is one way. There's going to be multiple ways that we can do the lighting system as long as we can get down to that 0.68 watts per square foot uh, or the 0.75 average. And if you as a designer want to do a uh, task ambient lighting system that uses LEDs, go for it. Um, you know, we were able to get to uh, the energy savings targets that we needed by using a general overhead lighting system, uh, task lighting as appropriate. Um, as you reduce your overall uh, watts per square foot, make your systems extremely efficient, uh, as I think we did in this guide. Um, other systems, say like a task ambient system, um, may provide uh, the same energy savings, but they may actually not, depending on the technology you use. You may go from, in the case of what we were using here, see a two-lamp fixture for the general lighting to a one-lamp fixture for the general lighting. Can I take that um, point three four watts per square foot and put it into a task lighting system and actually do the same thing. With current technology, the question or the answer might be no. We're kind of at that, that, that point where we need a technology, uh, a breakthrough technology like maybe LEDs, which are uh, rapidly evolving. I'm not saying that they're a good or a bad thing right now. There, there's some, some good and bad out there in those. We need something a little more efficient or effective than, let's say, moving that watts per square foot into a fluorescent system that's down low. 
uh, doesn't always give me uh, what I'm looking for. So yes and no on that. And a quickly, I see we're quickly running out of time, but a second question um, on must daylighting controls be automatic or is manual okay? No, the, the daylighting controls must be automatic um, in, in the open office plan uh, area to, to save the energy that we need. And in those open office plans, you don't want people manually going and turning the lights up and down. You want to tap it automatically. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Bing, I believe, has uh, one more question that she would like to address. Bing? Yeah. Um, I have one more question. It's very important to address that. The question is, is cost of construction a consideration in the development of the guide? I said definitely yes. Uh, they, again, but on the other side, this is not a minimum cost or standard. So we didn't, and we didn't need to follow off the rigorous, you know, cost effective analysis or minimum cost criteria uh, as we did when we developed 90.1, uh, uh, actually 90.1 standard. However, when we pick certain technologies and the systems, we always have a cost in mind. If you're really interested in the cost effective analysis, as I show you in the slides, and go download the technical support document on the last chapter of that document, we actually show you if you're using this, all these packages compared to conventional systems design, uh, what is the simple payback for that particular different locations. So that could be a good information for you to get some idea, ballpark idea estimate in terms of your cost. The other part I cannot emphasize more is through the integrated design process, we could possibly find a way, very optimized way, you know, we switch within your body, but you switch your cost and share the cost from one discipline or to the other one. You put up from the cost on passive design, then you save the cost on maybe on the mechanical system. So just a thought. Great. Thank you, Bing. And thanks so much to all of our speakers. I very much appreciate